Hello, this is lecture 16 in our series, and today we're doing the path integral quantization of the scalar field. This may seem like a few steps back in our course because we already quantized the scalar field, but doing it through uh, path integral will give us new insights on the structure of the theory. Uh, and I think that's worth doing. You're looking at it from a different perspective and that always help, uh, always helps with the understanding of, of, of a theory. Right? So just to do a quick uh, uh, review, right? We did path integral quantization before of uh, harmonic oscillators. We did it many times. We, we found some uh, details on the boundary conditions of the path integral were very important and in the end the state of the art the way that we found that was more direct way of doing it was through uh, uh, the Vic rotation so doing the quantization on the Euclidean space and then rotating back so essentially the, the steps we took in the in the harmonic oscillator was write the partition function in Euclidean space so we wrote the action in Euclidean space and a partition function there, right? Which, which is written in terms of a path integral over all closed paths in the Euclidean space. Then we, we can take a projection of that by making the period of these closed paths infinite, right? Uh, and I, we have seen that that is equivalent to going to the zero temperature of the system, which means the vacuum. And once we got whatever quantity we were calculating at this vacuum, then we rotated back to Minkowski space, right? of course, avoiding poles. And we have seen that once you do that, you get exactly the Feynman prescription. Your propagators become Feynman propagators. You've stopped the, the path of integration right before the poles. So we'll be avoiding the poles in the usual way for a Feynman prescription. Uh, and, and which which was which was good, right? It, was sh uh, uh, it, it shows us that you're doing the same as in the Feynman prescription. So in the end, you're getting the same uh, boundary conditions that we um, we have used before doing the Euclidean space, which were asymptotic vacuum states, right? We did all of that in the harmonic oscillator case, which in which the only um, the only um, parameter of the system is time. So in that sense, that's the same as a zero-dimensional quantum field theory because you have time but no space. Right? Now we'll generalize that procedure to three space coordinates plus time. We're doing the same with time. We'll be doing the Vic rotation in time. But now you have three extra coordinates which are the, the uh, three-dimensional space coordinates. Right? Uh, I, I listed, I mean, this uh, path integral quantization of the scalar field is done in many books, so I listed at least four, four of them here, right? in case you want to follow that in any of those books. Right? So le let's, uh, let's move on to the quantization. The first thing we need is to get the action in the Euclidean space. So what, what we know about the, the scalar field is that The action, let's create, let's write what i times the action because that's what shows up on top of exponential, right? Is i integral over space time of the Lagrangian, right? Del mu phi, del mu phi minus half m square phi square. minus v phi. Right? Remember that in our convention, the metric has a signature, which is uh, plus, minus, minus, minus. Most books that do Euclidean space quantization use the opposite convention. So be careful with that. Right? And we know how to get the green functions, right? which are endpoint functions. In this case, since I'm putting interactions here, I'll use omega here. And 
these are the products, the time ordered product of operators, which you, we know how to calculate in the canonical uh, formalism, right? Just use Feynman's theorem and span these and everything that we have been doing. Okay? And now we want also to write these in terms of a path integral, which you know is this what? I just plug in this i times the action up here, right? And I have this product of fields here, which now are functions of space-time, right? They just uh, are, are functions. They are not operators anymore inside this integral. Okay, so it's important. The first thing to, to understand here is important to see where this information is contained here, right? Why is this omega and not zero, for instance? How would I put this on this side? Well, the fact that if, if you're writing these as the free theory or the interacting theory is really on the action, right? If there is an interaction here, it's omega. And if there's no interaction, it would be zero. But where is the information that I have actually the vacuum? That's on the boundary conditions of the path integral, right? In Minkowski space, we know it's a bit complicated. We have to be careful about these boundary conditions. We know what they are for the harmonic oscillator. It's a similar thing for fields, but we'll actually go to Euclidean space and then the, those will be periodic boundary conditions. But it's important. Every uh, information about these initial and final states is now contained it's hidden here in the conditions of the path of integration and the action, right? That's what determines what kind of state I'm calculating this green function on. Right? Uh, now, if I want to rot rotate this to Euclidean space, there's a few things I have to remember, right? So I'll do essentially, I'll just rotate time. So now I'll take x zero which is one of the components in these fields here, and rotate it, right? In my metric, x0 is the same as x0 up and down, right? And I'll define a new x, which I'll call x4, or you could call it x0 Euclidean, whatever you prefer, right? So x4, which again is the same as up or down index, right, is the Euclidean time we had before, right, and this is the same direction we were rotating before. Of course, in Euclidean space, if I take a product like that, and I'm now mu is going not from 0 to 3, but from 1 to 4, right, this is the same as this, which is the same as this, because the Euclidean metric is just one, 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 right? Every, every component of the Euclidean metric is positive. So it doesn't matter if I put uh, these um, indexes up or down because this is always positive. Right? And then the, if I invert this relation, I get, of course, right? This is obvious. Hmm? That means that my, my fields, which are now defined, uh, Take this part, right? Del mu phi, del mu phi in Minkowski. That's del phi, del x, not del phi, del x, not minus del i phi, del i phi. And when I, I write i or j, these indexes go just from 1 to 3. Right, so this is just space derivatives. Now, if I use this substitution here, right, I get minus del phi del x4 times del phi del x4, because I, I got two powers of i, right, and that's the sign I have here, minus this. which means that this is the same as minus del mu phi 
in the Euclidean metric, the ohm mu phi in the Euclidean. Right? So I have to substitute this up here. For the rest of the fields, I do the same uh, for the fields themselves, right? I do the same I did before. So I have an x of x mu, which will rotate on some x of i for the space, uh, for the time coordinate. We'll, this will become minus x4, x, which I just name phi Euclidean of x Euclidean, right? But I'll suppress these Euclideans. I just call that phi of x. So the fields themselves do not change at all. The expression of the action is the same, right? I have another factor of i that comes from the, the integration element, the, the time part, that will conceal this i outside. Right? So in the end, I get that minus the Euclidean action of phi is given by minus d for x half del mu phi del mu phi plus half of m square phi square plus v of phi right so this sign here i put up here took all these uh i have an overall sign that goes out this i goes away with the I, minus i that comes out of here and you have in the top of the exponential this expression on the right here which i just named minus se right so se is just this part this is very similar to the harmonic oscillator Right? So you can tell, mostly, you can tell uh, when people are working in the Euclidean, well, this I on the outside is a very telltale sign, but also you have this relative sign between the kinetic and mass part, which is usually a, a good way of telling, too. Right? Of course, that depends on other things, but usually indicates. And now the green functions will be calculated based on these Euclidean actions, so not much changes, right? I'll just indicate Euclidean for now. Uh, x1 to xn. And now every single one of these coordinates have four components that go x1, x2, x3, x4. Right? And this uh, path integral is given in terms of minus s Euclidean of phi times the Euclidean fields. It's the same, right? The expression, the only change is really up here. Right? And um, that's all we care about. And, 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 and finally, I can define <coughs> the partition function, which, are, which is our generating functional, Z of beta, uh, J in the presence of sources, right? As the trace of the exponential of minus beta times the Hamiltonian in the presence of sources, right? Which we have shown in the case of the harmonic oscillator that can be written as this path integral for a particular boundary condition, which is the closed uh, paths. Let me just write the action here. Euclidean plus J phi. And we have very particular boundary conditions here, which are these. Right? The Euclidean plus beta is the same as phi of x the Euclidean, right? This is all closed paths, and I'm integrating also over this point, right? At the edge, I mean, all points are the same, but I'm integrating over all closed paths. Also, I have redefined, before when we had these scalar products between j and phi, or j and q, 
right? That was just an integral in dt, jt, qt, right? That's what this, in, this scalar product mean, meant in the harmonic oscillator case. In here, of course, is the generalization of that to uh, uh, space-time, right? So this uh, just means the 4x in Euclidean now, right? j of x, phi of x. If I would be very rigorous with my notation, there would be Euclideans everywhere. Which I will not be carrying over. And understood that from this point on, until I say otherwise, we're in Euclidean space everywhere, right? Uh, and of course, then if I take the zero uh, temperature limit, which means beta, which is also right, the beta and uh, is the boundary. Uh, is the the size of these closed loops, right? So I take beta to infinity, that's equivalent to the zero temperature limit, and z of j is the integral of the, the phi exponential, everything again, right? Plus j phi, which if you remember, the harmonic oscillator is just a vacuum, vacuum transition. Now I could use zero or omega, depends on if I have interactions here or not. In this case, I'm just putting zero, but it's understood that that depends on, on the action, right? In the presence of sources. In this case, in the presence of sources, of course, I can take the source to zero, to, and then that should be normalized to one. Right in the, in the absence of sources, and of course I'm going a little bit fast here, but I hope you realize that all I'm doing is putting three extra space dimensions, which don't do much here. Right? It's just generalization of everything we have shown for the the harmonic oscillator. So I'm going a little bit fast because there's not there's not there's no subtleties in this part. It's just the same we did for time with these three extra coordinates present. And the green functions can be obtained from this guy. Just as derivatives on, on the source. And now there's no i in here because uh, in Euclidean space I don't need to get rid of factors of i. And when I send the source to zero, if I want green functions in the absence of sources, otherwise I usually put a j here to indicate, uh, I can also calculate the green function in the presence of sources. And of course, by definition, I can rewrite this z of j in terms of the green functions themselves, right? which helps with the derivative sometimes, right? So I could just write this guy as a series in the green functions, right? I have the integral over, I go from one to n, d for x, i, g of x1, x and I have one integral for for each x because this is a scalar product of g with all the sources right as many sources as I have points here right integrals in, in the four position everything in Euclidean space so I can use when I when I want to get the green function I can use either this expression or this one sometimes this one will be useful just to avoid doing too many integrals uh, but most of the time it's easier to differentiate the exponential. As always, we'll be quite uh, limited on how we can treat interactions here, right? We'll have to, to do perturbation theory to include 
interactions in this theory. So I'll do the usual uh, separation, right? So my action, my Euclidean action in this case, will be separated in a free part, which is the Gaussian part of, of the action, and the uh, uh, interaction, interaction term, which contains everything but the Gaussian part. Right? And I want to write my green functions in a way that allows me to, to use this separation. Right? I want one of the things I want to do, so I'm, I'm taking kind of the same steps I took in the canonical formalism, is to go to momentum space, because we know we'll be doing scatterings eventually, right? So I'll, I'll just define this momentum space green function. And this is just the Fourier transform of the position space green function. Pn xn, gn of x1 to xn. All right, so this is the momentum space green function. And just to already get the momentum conservation out of here, we can notice that in any, any theory that is uh, invariant under space-time translations, which is one that conserves energy and momentum, I can just rewrite this green function as uh, this where this capital X here is just a shift, right? I just did a, a translation, a general translation in uh, time and space. Actually, let me use a minus sign here, because what I want to do is the following, right? Let's take this shift to be equal to x1. So essentially, I'm eliminating, I'm, I'm moving this coordinate to the origin, right? And then after that, I will have to substitute this, I'll shift every coordinate but x1, which will disappear from here. And then I do the following change of variables. In every other coordinate, I just take for i bigger or equal to 2, I just stay, take xi to xi plus x1. Right? And then what happens? What happens is this guy just becomes, right? the x, the, the green function of 0, and every other coordinate, this, this x1 will cancel out with this minus x1, right? So I just have a green function that depends on one less position on the right side of this integral. But the rest of the integral becomes very interesting because what I'm showing is that assuming this uh, invariance of the green function under these translations, right? I can separate the two integrals. So the integral in d for x1 separates from the others because I have now a term which is p, all the p's times x1. Also, I have an exponential i x1, p1 plus all of them until Pn. And uh, this is multiplying the integrals in d for x2 all the way to d for xn. times exponential that does not involve x1 at all. It's just from p2 x2 all the way to pn xn. Right? That's what I get if I do this change 
in the green function that should be equal. So I just plug these in here. Take x equal to x1. I make these happen, right? Uh, I mean, these guys will all have minus x1, minus x1 here. But then I do this change of variables for these integrals. And I separate the system in two parts, right? And the first one is just a direct delta. So essentially what I, what I managed to do here is write this as the 2 pi to the 4 delta of momentum conservation, P1 Pn. This is the total momentum conservation, which is useful, right? We want to have this uh, um, in front, right? And I baptize what is left. You see, what is left here is a Fourier transform of this function, which depends on one less momenta, right? I, I'm transforming all these coordinates, and I don't have one less momenta than I had here. I can still indicate this like that, P1 to Pn. But I have to remember that one of these momenta is not independent on the others. It's actually fixed by this condition. So in this case, P1 is just a function of P2, P3, P2. So this guy depends only on P2, P3, P4, all the way to Pn, right? Does not depend on P1 because it's just a function of the other. Of course, that's not particular to P1. I could choose any of these momenta to be just a function of the other moment. And this guy is, is, is the guy where we indicate without the tilde. Is, is the green momentum space green function in which it's implied already uh, momentum conservation. Now let me show you a very important result called the Dyson formula, right? Let me start with just a vacuum expectation value of some generic operator, which depends on the fields uh, phi. So when I write vacuum like that, I mean the free theory vacuum. So that means that in my action on the right side of this equation, I'm putting just the S0 part. And uh, let me just put the operator here. And it also means that I'm taking the periodic, the period of my closed uh, uh, paths to infinity. So on this side, it's implied that I'm taking uh, beta to infinity here, right? And since I'm putting only the free theory, that's a zero over there. Now, suppose that this operator is not any operator, but it is actually the exponential of the interacting part of the action. Now, what I'm calculating is the vacuum expectation value of this. But if I substitute this on the right side of this uh, equation, that will give me just del phi of at zero phi minus S i of phi. And more. Suppose now this, this operator I'm putting here is actually a product of fields times this exponential of the interacting part. Then the expression I'm obtaining, again, it's very similar to this one. Give me some space here. Right? But now I have all these operators here and here. I don't even have space. On this side, they are not operators. Correct? 
just because in the path integral they become functions which is by the way in this case right this is the full green function of the interacting theory right this is any green function of the interacting theory and remember this is not time ordered here because we are in the euclidean space but when you go back you know that this integral will always give me uh, the time order product of these guys right remember how this integral works path integral always gives me the time order uh, green the, these green functions will be equal to the time order in the operator uh, formalism right and finally i could even put sources over here i could take sorry i for i erased part of my operator i could also include sources here making this operator i'm using every time just the exponential of the interacting part times this exponential of j times phi right there's a, a integral in four uh, coordinates here and that would give me just this relation right zero exponential of minus interaction phi exponential of j phi in the free theory vacuum is equal to del phi exponential of minus s0 phi minus si phi plus j phi which is the partition function right this is the actual definition of the partition function and this I put a box here this is a what we call Dyson formula hmm? so notice that on the right side of these uh, equations I got green functions or the partition function in this case from you can go from here to there just making derivatives on on the sources right that will take down powers of phi from here so essentially you can get these two one from the other very easily but notice that on the right side I have green functions for the full theory so here is the free part this is the interacting part but on the right side I have these operators between the free theory states in especially the vacuum of the free theory which is very similar in spirit to the uh, remember I'm in Euclidean space here so there's no subtleties with time being slightly imaginary we'll get all those subtleties when we try to go back to Minkowski but in spirit this is very similar to Feynman's theorem right I'm relating quantities uh, a green function of the full theory to something that only involves the interacting part of the theory acting on the free vacuum and remember how difficult it was to prove that in the operator formalism and how this is just a definition basically of how these path integrals work on the path integral case this was very easy to prove right it's most every step is almost obvious in this case okay? so that's one of the powers of uh, of uh, the path integration some proofs are just incredibly obvious some properties are just incredibly obvious in, in, in this formula now let's take a look at the solutions for the free theory in the case that the interaction term is zero right we have the partition function I'll put a zero in the partition function here just to remember that we're talking about the partition function 
in this case of the free theory, right? which will also be the first term in the if I do a, a series a perturbative expansion of the free of the partition function, this will be also the first term, right? And, and, and this can be written as the o phi, the, the phi of the exponential of minus s zero of phi plus j phi, which written in a more explicit way is let me get space here phi exponential of minus half integral in b for x down mu phi down mu phi plus because we are in Euclidean space m square phi square this closes this integral I'll keep indicating the other one by the scalar product just to keep it short right? and, and this closes the exponential well, so this is what we want to integrate in our path integral right I can do a, a, a integration by parts here to throw the two derivatives in one of these fields this is very easy to do here because remember we have periodic conditions so the surface terms will just can see each other. So I do this um, and write this exponential as del phi. I'm just changing this part to write it uh, in this way. Phi minus del mu del mu plus m square phi right and this is what I, I i call my inverse propagator right this is the operator i have to invert to get the propagator it helps to notice that i can rewrite these um, exponential in terms of the classical solutions as we do as we did with the harmonic oscillator so that's easy to do I, I I want something that looks like this right Phi minus the classical solution right and there are scalar products in many places here. And if I, I expand these, you'll see that I get just minus uh, one half of phi delta minus one phi, right? Plus half of phi j, because by definition, when delta meets delta minus one, this is just the identity, half of j phi. And of course, this is just a scalar product, so. We can put these two together and, and just get j phi and I have this leftover term that is not there right so this is here this is here but this this extra term I don't have up here yet right? so if I want to rewrite these in terms of this product right I can I have two add and subtract that part right, to complete the squares and, uh, and, and then I get just del phi exponential actually let me minus half phi j delta delta minus one phi minus delta j this guy will baptize phi classical and you can easily go to the the action and show that this is the classical solution if you do the extreme action there you see that this is the classical solution delta times j and 
the extra term that I needed. Right? So I added and subtract this and absorb the negative part in here to write this uh, first term. And then I do the usual, right? I shift my integration from this phi into a phi prime, which is defined by this expression. Right, so I define a phi prime, and then I can, of course, since this is just a shift, right? This is a constant in the path of the, in the path integral. I can just put a phi prime here, and this guy goes outside the integral because it does not depend on phi or phi prime, right? So in the end, I have again I'm going as fast as I can in this part because this is so similar to what we did uh, in the um, harmonic oscillator. And this integral, again, if you look at it, right, this is just Remember, the boundary conditions are so that I'm projecting in the vacuum. Uh, and uh, since I'm from the start with the free theory, this is the vacuum of the free theory in the absence of sources, because there's no sources in here. The sources went outside. Right? And so what, what I got here is that Z I don't even care too much about this number. Remember, we got these before in the harmonic oscillator. And in order to obtain the green function, they'll be, I'll make derivatives in J. Right? So this is a, just a multiplicative constant that is in front of all green functions that I don't care too much because really the, the, the derivatives will act on this part. Right? But in any way, I can write these, right? Which again, very similar to what we got in the harmonic oscillator. Zero here means absence of sources. And the normalization is set by this condition that Z, Z, zero in the absence of sources. This is just this, which is equal to one. Right? And this will be the normalization that I use everywhere. So this basically disappears. So this is the result we wanted. And now I need to know the form of, of delta, right? The operator that I inverted. Right? So delta minus 1 is in the Euclidean space. It's just this. Right? Which means that the inverse is quite obvious. is written in terms of a Fourier transform. Everything here is in the Euclidean uh, space. And this guy is perfect, right? This is the propagator in the Euclidean space. And there's no poles in the path of integration. Everything is fine. And Wonderful, right? Sadly, we don't live on a Euclidean space-time. We have to go back to Minkowski, right? Which is more complicated. So, when I'm rotating back, remember, if you go back to page 47 in my notes, you'll see how I rotated back. Here's the same story, right? But I'll rotate only the energy part of this, and, and, and the direction is set by uh, the condition that time uh, times energy keeps the same sign, right, in both uh, spaces, Euclidean and Minkowski. Go to page 47 and look for that. But the conclusion is I, I have to avoid the poles, right? If you look for the poles of this guy, you see that they are in the imaginary axis, 
So when the module of P is equal to plus or minus I times the mass, so they are in the imaginary uh, axis, right? And if, if I'm thinking specifically about P0, they are in these va values for P0, right? Uh, so what I have to be careful is that P0 Euclidean will now be rotated 90 degrees in this particular direction. But I cannot touch the pure imaginary axis. So I'm subtracting epsilon from 90 degrees here. I'm almost rotating all the way to the Minkowski uh, P0, the energy, right? Which written, if I expand this exponential, is uh, for small epsilon, right? Which is real and positive. I get minus i p0 plus i epsilon. And that's what I have to substitute there. I will do almost a 90 degree rotation. I stop short of the imaginary axis. That means that the denominator here, which is p square plus m square, which Euclidean, right? Which in the Euclidean means p0 square plus p vector square plus m square, which is using this, uh, this uh, rotation minus p0 plus i epsilon square, right? I have p0 square here, so plus the vector part plus m square which now I will expand, of course, the terms that are proportional to epsilon square, I throw away, right? And I get minus P0 square plus P square plus M square minus I epsilon prime. There's a factor of two here, but I don't care, right? It's just a small number, which then I can rewrite, because this is the Minkowski space now, uh, P square, right? This is just minus P mu, P mu, in Minkowski now. So this I can write as minus P square plus M square plus, oh, sorry, minus, I epsilon. I'm dropping the prime because I don't care too much about it. And then I go back to delta, right? I have to, this is what happens in this denominator. I have to take a look at the rest. For instance, the scalar products of the sort, I also don't need this y, right? I take y to zero, right? But uh, products like these in Euclidean will now become Right? This is the definition of this product in Euclidean, which is appearing on top of the exponential here. And these, I have to rotate both. In this, I can go all the way because there's no point in keeping the epsilons on top of the exponentials, right? The epsilon, I'll keep the, the epsilon, epsilon only here where I actually try to avoid the pole. I x naught plus p x, right? And you see there's there's a problem with signs here, but since this is in an integral, right? And this denominator does not change with changes of sign in the integral, I can do a uh, change of variables in my integral, taking p0 to minus p0. That changes nothing, right? This This part here, gets a, a sign, but then the limits of the integral invert and I have to invert back and that absorbs that sign. So I really only change the sign in the exponential, right? And then if I change the sign of P0 here, these would become minus P, P mu X mu, which is what I, I want, right? So I can use a trick, a trick here in the, in the integration. That's the kind of trick 
you don't have to do if you're using uh, a, a metric which is this diagonal instead of the one you're using. Right? So that's why people that do Euclidean uh, uh, field theory usually prefer to use this metric because you don't have to be correcting for for signs of time every time you try to rotate back to Minkowski. So the, these are more direct if you have the other signature of the metric. But in any case, the result needs to be the same, right? This needs to work for any metric. So what I'm writing here now is delta of T Euclidean that I rotate to my to I T Minkowski x I made y equals zero. I just to have a shift in my uh, to the origin there to keep just one number. And this is the f, and this f I'll, you, I'll show you in a second, because when we put everything together, right, this integral uh, changes very easily. I just get a factor of minus i, right? So from the integration measure, I got a minus i. In the denominator, I have minus p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. Sorry, epsilon. And the exponential has become just minus i p x Minkowski. Right? Minus i p x. Now, this minus sign, I can change everything down here. And I got Feynman's propagator, as I should. All right? So the moment I try to go back to Minkowski, I get the Feynman propagator with the right prescription on how to go around the poles. Right? Because I demanded on the Euclidean side a projection on the vacuum. And again, I get the same Feynman prescription, which is kind of cool, right? You're doing through a completely different path and you still get these same uh, propagators. Again, we see this connection on how you project on the asymptotic states and, and, and Feynman's propagator. Now we have the Feynman propagator and we also have something which is very similar to Feynman's theorem up here, right? So we have seen that we can actually calculate these as transition between vacuum states. And we know what happens with that, right? We're expanding these and we have a product of operators on this side, right? Which lead us, right? Once you have these exponentials truncated to some order, you just have a product of many operators that lead us to Vick's theorem. But how does Vick's theorem look on, on this side? Right, if we get, want to calculate the green functions straight from the path integral without using the operator uh, formally, how does it look? So that's our objective now to, to see how uh, uh, how Vick theorem will work on the path integral. Okay. So first, let's let's do a simple exercise here, which is to think of a uh, of, of a function of these fields. Take a function of a collection of fields, let's say just for the sake of being definite, totally arbitrary one, just I want to show a very good property of working with path integrals. So take this function, right? This is just a product like any other product that you have could have of fields calculated at different points in space-time. So I have x1, x2, and x3, three points in space-time, and I have phi to the square applying x1 and phi to the fourth in x3, etc. Right? Now, if I want to, to calculate the expectation, vacuum expectation value of this function with a path integral, and remember, I'm not worrying about time ordering here because that comes when you rotate back to Vic uh, 
uh, to Minkowski space. Uh, so I'm writing everything in Euclidean space. If you want to calculate that with a path integral, what you do is calculate the path integral, the exponential of minus the action. And let's think of the t free theory first. So S0 means free theory. And then I just put this product over here. I just take this. Plug here. And we're done. Right? This, the, if I calculate this integral, that's the uh, vacuum expectation value of the function. But note the following. Right? If I apply any functional derivative in a source to the exponential of the source. This is the same as the exponential times, I mean, we did some exercises on these functional derivatives when we were using the harmonic oscillator of this scalar product right here, right? D4x, Jx, phi x right? and and we know that this derivative will act on j here giving just a delta 4 of x1 minus x right which then can which then can be used to integrate in x right and we have just phi of x1 times the exponential So, multiplication of phi by this exponential is the same as the derivative in the exponential, right? And we can use this a lot, right? For instance, in this case, right? Suppose I want to rewrite this expression using this fact. I can rewrite this in the following way. Let me just exchange each of these guys by derivatives. So the first one, I just take two times the derivative in relation to, let me do it like this, right? X1, one time the derivative in relation to j of x2 and four times in relation to j of x3. That acting on this integral, right? of course the derivatives go out of the integral, but I have to add a j phi term here, right? Otherwise there's nowhere for these guys to act. And remove it again in the end. So I, uh, this should be understood as first I act with the derivatives, then I take j to zero. That's another way of writing the expression above, right? It will give me exactly the same result. Hmm? And we can generalize this for an arbitrary function as long as the function, whatever is this function here, if it can be written as a power series of the fields, then I can I can generalize this, right? As long as it's, I can write it as a power or a series, powers of phi, then I can generalize this and write the following very useful expression, which is that the vacuum expectation value of a function of phi Let's do it in the presence of sources. Is equal to F of the derivatives. And this notation means exactly what I did up here. So I go and look at the function everywhere. There's phi I substitute it by a derivative. And if this is a series on phi, I put the derivative there. But it's implied that I, I actually make the series and put derivatives in all places where phi was acting on the free uh, partition function of j. 
And of course, I can take these, uh, make the derivatives and take j to zero on both sides in case the source is not physical, right? I can, I can use this both when I actually have a source, which will happen sometimes, or when I use just a source as a mathematical aid to write expressions like this, and I take it to zero at the end. One way or, or another, this equation is valid. Right? Now let's go back to, to Dyson uh, formula, right? We had proven uh, a few minutes ago that z, z of j can be written as del phi, d phi, exponential of s0 phi minus s interacting of phi plus j phi and according to Dyson's formula this is the same as j zero exponential of minus s i of phi zero j right including the sources there right and uh, let me rewrite this this uh, interacting interacting part of the Lagrangian in the way we used to, right? So I, I, I have been calling, if I write the Lagrangian density, the part of the Lagrangian, the, the Lagrangian density that is contained here is the non-Gaussian part, because the Gaussian part is contained in, over there, right? And this part I have been calling V of phi of x, of course, right? So this is what this guy is. So I can put this over here. This is minus d for x, v of phi of x, zero j. And now I can use this. Can use this expression. This will be my f. Right? This is the function of phi, which is in fact defined as a series. Right? This exponential is just a series in powers of v, which in turn is powers of phi. Right? So I can use that expression and write and write the following. z of j will be the exponential of minus d for x v of del del j of x so I have to understand this expression I just write the potential as normal but I'll substitute phi by derivatives functional derivatives in fact acting on z zero in the presence of sources, right? This j here means I'm calculating this zero, including this part and this part of the exponential in the calculation. And then I use the expression, the expression for z zero of j that I got before when I was solving the free theory, because that z is for the free theory. Right? This one, I can use this expression. Right? This is just one, so all I have is this. So I can just rewrite this one as <clears throat> exponential of half j delta j. You see? So let me put a box around this. This is not very obvious, right? But this is Vick's theorem. Vick's theorem is already contained here. We'll see how in a moment. But for now, notice what I did, right? Uh, 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 we already know that when I'm calculating green functions, 
the green functions will be obtained from the generating functional just by applying derivatives in j. Right? Now I have also these derivatives, but uh, I have also these derivatives in j for each vertex. Right? You know, the, the g, let me write this because this is important, g of x1, x2, will be del, del j of x1, del, del j of x2, acting on z. And if you have no sources in the end, you put j to zero. Okay? These derivatives are on the external points. Okay? Now, I wrote this in a way that I also have derivatives for the internal points. You see, the points in this exponential here are the points of the, the vertex, the vertices, right? Once I expand this exponential to some order in the perturbation theory, for each term, I'll have a, a number of vertices, and I also have derivatives acting here for the internal point. So I have now two sets of derivatives, one coming from this, which is the vertices, and one coming from the green function, which are the external points. And everything is written as derivatives acting on j. Right? We'll see that how that leads us to the, the Vick's theorem. That's easier to do if we actually go ahead and calculate a few green uh, functions and, and get the Feynman rules for, for, for some interaction. That will be much easier to see uh, how this is totally equivalent to, to Vick's theorem. Right, so let's use the same notation we used before. So I'll call the green function g n p right, as the function of n points. That's what n means. Calculated of at order p in the perturbative expansion. Right. So if I look at this expression, right, I can write the perturbative expansion straight away. Right. I just have to take this exponential right here and expand it in power in a power series right that will become just one minus the integral let's call this x v del del j x plus one over two factorial d for x of this times a d for uh, y of this one and so on, right? Then I have three times, four times the, the potential and that all of that acts on this exponential right here. Right, so that's essentially the the perturbative expansion. If I truncate it somewhere, right, I get the approximation to z at some order, and that's why I, I use this to define, right, some quantities which are the the partition functions calculated at some order in perturbation. Right? Z zero is the one I have been using, the free theory one plus this is z0, right? Just exponential. This one is called z1 of j. I mean, including the exponential, of course. It's this acting on the exponential, and this one is z2, and so on, right? So these derivatives, the number of times I apply these derivatives in that exponential, Give me the gives me the perturbative expansion, and then if I want to calculate the green function, <coughs> the green function will be just a few more derivatives now on the external points. Right in here, I only have derivatives on the internal ones. acting on z, p, right? Because then I know 
I only took the theory at some specific order in the perturbative expansion. Yeah, so essentially that's what I want to calculate and the number of derivatives depends both on the number of external points and the order in which I'm stopping my perturbative expansion. So this is generic expression for G of NP which is again somewhat nicer written in terms of functional derivatives than in terms of uh, operators. Right? You can write everything in a more compact way, even if a little bit less transparent, right? And now let's let's calculate. Let's take g one zero. This is the one point function in the presence of sources at for the free theory, right? At zero order in the perturbative expansion. That's the easiest thing to do, but it's a very useful object. And now that we know a little bit of Feynman diagrams, we can straight away rewrite these diagrammatically and that's that's the important part right so let's take a look i just have to apply this on this guy right so of course this is just the exponential and then i have the derivative acting first on this j and then on this one right these two scalar products give me a, a uh, integral in two variables that I'll call just uh, d4x and d4x prime of jx delta xx prime jx prime right and the derivative is acting on this when it acts here I have a delta of x x1 and then I integrate on x, and x1 ends up here, on this position, right? When this acts on this second part, I have a delta of x prime x1, which then allows me to do the integral in, integral in x prime, and x1 ends here, in this position. It doesn't matter, because this guy is symmetric under the exchange of x and x prime. So I can just use that to elimin eliminate a factor 2 that I actually forgot here. There was a half up there, right? Should be here. Right? Because I'll have twice the same result, which is just... Let me copy the exponential. D4x <coughs> delta x1x j of x, right? Because I can, in the case I integrated on on x, I can always call x prime x later and, and get this, which is just the scalar product of delta j, and this is a function of x1, right? It does not depend on x because that's integrated, but it is a function of x1. So my conclusion here, we did this in, there was an exercise for the harmonic oscillator where you should have obtained something very similar to that way, uh, uh, some time ago. But the important point is this, right? Then J delta J. So doing the derivative on this exponential takes down this function of x1, right? I just introduced a dependence on x1 that was not here on the exponential. And diagrammatically, we can rewrite this in the following way. So, I usually use this symbol to represent a source, right? Uh, external source, something that is not quantized, right? And, and then, this equation is written as j of x exponential source to source and notice this is exactly what's written here because it's source propagator source right source propagator source and even this factor half 
comes from the fact that the position of the source is not specified, is integrated over. So there is a symmetry factor through the exchange of sources here. And that symmetry, so if you apply Feynman rules and just associated this to a source, right, acting on, 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 on this point, which in this case is integrated, right, you get this factor half is the symmetry factor of this diagram, very simple diagram. Now it is different from this one because in this one usually the points are fixed, so that's just delta. Okay? There's no symmetry factor. And on this side, what I have is just x1. Or in this case, I put x here, so it's x connecting to the source. And now there's no symmetry factor because the source is integrated all over space, but x is fixed right? times the exponential. So, in other words, and this is the important thing, when I do the, the derivative, I fix one of these points. I take one of the points, in, for, in fact I took both, but then there is this symmetry and I can just add the two options right here, and I fixed one of the points. And that's what these derivatives will do. They will take points which are integrated over and fix, attribute a fixed point to them, right? In this sense that I have a coordinate in space-time which is given, right? And of course, this function, if I take j to zero, right? In other words, if I calculate g one zero of x one, now, without the sources, I don't put a j here like I, I did up here, right? This is zero. So, the one-point function is zero, uh, in fact, for any free theory, right? Scalar one. So, that's an important thing. In the absence of sources, this, this is zero. This is true for the one-point function, but it's also true for any function of um, an odd number of external points. So if I take k equal to 0, 1, 2, etc., right, and, and calculate g 2k plus 1, that means all the odd functions in the free theory, mind you, right, I'm just talking about the free theory, right, of an odd uh, number of external points this will always be zero. And, and it is intuitive why, right? I, I, if I'm doing an odd number of derivatives and I have an even number of j's up here, right? in any term that will show up in the, this uh, chain rule for the derivatives, we'll have something like that in front. There will always be a leftover source that is not... Uh, differentiated, right? And that's when I take j to zero, mind you, this is in the absence of sources, that goes to zero. So all odd uh, green functions are zero in the free theory in the absence of sources, right? Now let's look at the two-point function, right? The two-point function, again, in the free theory, is just g to zero, x1, x2, j, right, in the presence of sources. And that's delta, delta j of x1, delta, delta j of x2, acting on the exponential. This one I know, right, this is just what I just calculated. Right, is that, that's the one-point function for the free theory, for point x2 in this case, in the presence of sources. So I just have to act with this del, delta j x1 on this scalar product, calculated at point x2, times the exponential j delta 
j which in turn is just uh, i have to apply i mean this derivative here and here i already know what happens with exponential let's look at this part right del del j x1 acting on this scalar product is the same as acting on delta 4x delta of x x2 again i'll repeat myself but doesn't matter the order here j of x right the derivative x here that becomes a delta of x x1 direct delta and i integrate so this is just right, delta x1, x2, right? As expected, one, when I, I act with the, this derivative, I fix one of the points. So again, diagrammatically, I can write this very easily. What I'm writing is that delta, delta j of x1 acting on x2 propagator j i don't put a point for j because that's integrated over right and this is just x2 x1 in any order right which again tells me that the second derivative what i trying to calculate right? now I can use this and this other derivative in terms of the diagrams right so I can do the product rule for the derivative here using these two so the first term will be just x2 x1 times the exponential but I'll bring the exponential outside to the right times this right which is just plus this x2 propagator j and the action of this derivative on the exponential which is ju just x1 j and this is all multiplying again the exponential right and this is the answer in terms of diagrams, I can write it explicitly also in terms of the mathematical expression. Like this, delta x1, x2 plus delta j of x1 delta j of x2 times the exponential of half j delta j right it's the same as uh, what's written diagrammatically up here and this is the two-point function in the presence of sources now you see that there's a part here that does not go to zero when I make the sources go to zero, right? If I take now j going to zero, right, and calculate uh, g two zero x one x two, no sources. This is just one. This is all zero, and I have just delta x one x two, which is what you expected for the Feynman rules, right? We are retaining again, now in Euclidean space, but if you rotate, you know how to rotate back to Minkowski, and you know that this propagator in the Euclidean space, when rotated back to Minkowski, gives you the Feynman propagator in, Fe in, in Minkowski space. We just did it. Huh? So I get the same fine rule for the two-point function I got, of course, with the operator formally. This is in, this is, this is more than important. This is was this is a reality check, right? Uh, if it was not the same, that would mean I made some mistake because 
path integrals are completely equivalent to the uh, to the operator formula. Yeah. So I could calculate the three-point function and the four-point function. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise to keep doing these derivatives. But uh, the logic is, uh, I hope, is already clear, right? If I put more derivatives, the derivatives just act on the loose points here, this source points, and fixes them, right? So if I had four derivatives, j4, 0. The 3.1 we know is 0, right? Again, I'll, uh, you calculate that in the exercise. But if now I have four uh, derivatives, acting on this exponential, you know that these derivatives will connect these sources in, in, and substitute the source for one of these points, which is fixed, in every way possible, right? Which is exactly what Wick's theorem does. So, in, 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 in terms of... Um, in terms of um, functional derivatives, Wick's theorem is nothing but the chain and the product rule, especially the product rule, right? You just connect these edges of, of this diagram in every way possible. So the result cannot be anything but what we're obtaining here. In fact, that was an exercise for the harmonic oscillator and you got an expression which is exactly the same as this one, but instead of having space-time here, you had just time, right? Because that's the only parameter in the case of the harmonic oscillator. And this is the four-point function, in the absence of sources already, right? It's a little bigger in the presence of sources. Again, you get that as an exercise. And you can do it and, and then take g, j to 0 to c. And, and of course, diagrammatically, what I'm doing is just connecting four points. In every way possible. Let's just number the points. So x1, x2, x3, x4. And what you're doing is x1 to x2, 3 to 4, the second term is 1 to 3, 2 to 4, and the last one is 1 to 4, 1 to 4, 2, 2, 3. There's no crossing here, right? The crossing will be four lines meeting at a point, which only shows up once I put interactions, as we know from the operator formulas, but the same will be true here. Well, there's not much difference. In fact, the next thing we'll do is include interactions in this path integral formalism and see, right, then start to calculate, uh, because so far we only calculate G0 for the free theory. Let's calculate G1 for some theory and see. In fact, the, what, what I want to show is that on the path Integral formalism is very easy to uh, to get a general way of getting Feynman rules for for any from any Lagrangian without doing what we have been doing, which is basically induction. Right? We have we look very a, a big number of diagrams, and we realize that every time a vertex show up, there's a mi minus i lambda in the case of lambda phi four. Right? There's a more generic way of seeing using these derivatives and that's the next thing we'll see but that that's for the next video and 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 this is really all for today see you soon